Thank you, Mrs. Bob. I can know my my memory going in and out. Good three for today. And how are you doing, Missy Bob? I'm doing well, Donald. How are you? I'm, I'm doing great for an old man. But we have a science show today. Uh, who do we have with us? Well, we have with us uh, Ale- Alejandro Polaris. Alex, I messed your name up, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Alejandro Palacios. I also go by Alex. <laughs> and we will call you Alex. Alex. Don't worry yeah. about it. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. I can be Alex. <laughs> Alex is an advocate, a community activist. Um, he's very involved in the issue of immigration, uh, rights for Latinas and Latinos. Uh, domestic violence and safety, uh, just uh, a number of things, but we'll let him talk a little more about that. Okay. So for now, should we just move to the power sure, scripture sure. for yes, today? Please. Okay, today I'm going to read from Matthew, the 25th chapter, and I'm going to read 35 through 40, and I'm reading from an NIV Bible. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When do we see you a stranger and invited you in, or needing clothing and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers, I'm sorry, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Amen. Alex, how are you doing today? Good, sir. I'm doing great. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for, for the invite and for having me. I'm glad to have you. Tell us about yourself. What have, what has brought you this far in your journey? Oh, well, okay. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, I am actually originally from Nogales, Sonora. Okay. Grew up uh, in the border. And I had the privilege, the, the opportunity to come over to the States to get my education. Okay. Uh, I moved to Phoenix in 2010. And when I moved to Phoenix, I, well, I didn't know the city, I didn't know anyone. And I decided, I made a decision that I, I wanted to be involved with, with the okay. community. I wanted to be supportive. I wanted to help. I didn't know exactly how I was going to do it. Mm-hmm. So I, I contact this agency. Uh, I looked up for their main number and called this agency Chicanos por la Causa. Okay. So I knew they they were a nonprofit and they helped. Mm-hmm. That's the extent that I that I knew at that point in time. So I contact their main line and I spoke to this very um supportive lady who asked asked me questions about my interests what did I like? What was I going to school for? Which at that time it was uh, a bachelor's in criminology and criminal justice. And also right now you work on your master's in administration, right? I'm about to start a, a master's program in its victim services management. Okay, good. Yes. So uh, when I reached out to, to them, they shared with me that they had a domestic violence shelter. Mm-hmm. And if I was interested in, in doing that kind of work, uh, being honest with you, I didn't know anything uh, about domestic violence. I had the privilege not to grow up in a domestic violence hostile environment. Mm-hmm. So I made the decision that I, it was something that I wanted to learn about. Okay. So I got in contact with the program director, and since I entered those doors, I was so impacted by 
by seeing so many children, so many females having to reach out to those kind of places due to the unfortunate situations that we're experiencing. Is that a major problem in the Hispanic community? Well, the domestic violence, we know that it happens all across the board. It's mm -hmm. not about religion, ethnicity, education, or economics. However, we see uh, we there is a lot of, of domestic violence in the Hispanic community. I believe mainly due to the um, fact that we teach our, our young boys in the Hispanic community many times that violence is a solution for many problems. Mm. And, and there's many times an unrealistic expectation of what a, a man is, a, a macho, how it's, it's known oh, in the okay. many times. Is that, is that machoism still a major part of defining who you are in, the, in, the, in that community? It is. It, machismo, it's really strong. And, and you know, when, when I got involved in the movement, I did some, some research in regards to the origins of machismo. And I found out that the origins was being a good provider for right. a family, a protected, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not what it has turned nowadays to be, a person that's abusive, that solves issues with violence, a man, for the most part, solves issues with violence, and has or is looking to have so many uh, sexual partners, something that it's, it's rerouted differently from its origins. What do you think? Do you think socialization in American culture has caused that, or do you think it's just adapted at, over time, I think it's just had that adapted over time. It, it's definitely changed. I see, and I saw it growing up in the border. Mm -hmm. I, I had the opportunity to see that cultural change and its adaptation, mm -hmm. and it was even reinforced when I moved to Phoenix and learned how big the Hispanic community is here in the valley and how it's been influenced uh, in good ways, but also in not very positive ways. Um, here in the States. So, Alex, how would you describe the current state of the Latino-Latina community uh, in this country? You know, I, I think, Yvonne, and that's a great question, I think that the Hispanic community, it's getting stronger. Okay. We know that there's a lot of community organizers out there. Mm -hmm. Information awareness, is it's building. Okay. So, we, we know from from the past that the uh, Hispanic Latino community was very oppressed, very silent. Right. People were afraid to get out of their homes. Now we've seen organized protests, uh, organized movement building. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the community is getting strong. Yeah, I, when I look at uh, what's going on in the Latino community, it seems to be it's where blacks were in the 60s. Yes. Mobilization, awareness, mobilization. That is. Do you think that's what's occurring right now? I think that's a very appropriate comparison because, as you mentioned, the six is what happened with, with the African American community, is what's happening with, with the Hispanic community. There's mm -hmm. community building, there's awareness, there's, um, they are making real strong ties with, with other community members. So I think that the movement is, is going forward and Latinos and Latinas are empowering themselves, their family okay. members, their own community to stand up for what's right. And many times what, Latino, what Latinas are, are uh, reaching out for is fairness, it's equality. All right. It's being identified as a person, not as Many times we hear we hear politicians or different person to really refer to them with language that's not appropriate to refer to as a person. Right, as a person, it's it's the same way that how they refer to black people in the fifties and sixties, you know, as this ad ad human or uh, somewhat animal type of terminology, them or th those people. Um, I think all people of color struggle with that right. uh, from majority people, like the, the people of color are the others. Yeah. Right. And so that language is used to identify the others who are different from us. It's interesting. I pastor uh, at one time a uh, it's like, uh, Latino <laughs> congregation, and a lot of issues they face I saw in the black community. You know, in terms of discrimination, in terms of um, the man not having a place, in terms of a society, economic issues, 
So is there, from your point of view, some points of bridging between the Latino community and other communities of color in terms of common issues where we can come together and, and respond to the issue of oppression that we both face? Yeah, definitely. One, one of the big issues nowadays, uh, there, there's a lot of conversations going on about, well, we, for the most part, all know it, it's immigration. But the other very important issue that the Latino Hispanic community is facing is education. Okay. The opportunity to obtain an education. Because when you are prevented or you know, have the privilege to obtain education or are not afraid to enroll in college or to seek a master's degree, that definitely impacts your entire la life. Subsequently, it, it impacts your, your income, and then we go into the issue of economy. Hmm. How, how can you overcome uh, different situations if you are not able to, let's say, let's mm -hmm. an equal edu proper education, mm -hmm. therefore having the ability to obtain a different job or, or build a career or something that you are very interested in as opposed to a job that you have to do or take because you were unable to get a career, to go to school. I find that the, the Matizzo concept influenced education. Yeah. You know, that it's not appropriate for a man to go to college or to become educated because it seems like a woman's role or a female role. Is that right? I, that's, that's what I'm seeing from the outside. I don't know whether or not yeah. that's correct. You, you know, what, what I've seen nowadays, it's kind of the opposite. Um, females struggling to be accepted okay. as, as equal, as having the same opportunities to build a career, a professional career, to be a job, you know, breaking that stereotype, that stigma that females, Hispanic women, belong in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And and that's an, an, an issue that we have all around the, the, the country. However, with the Hispanic community, that's a struggle for women, being recognized as equal, not only as a cook in the home or the person who takes care of the children, oh, okay. but, but a person who is equal to their partner, even economically and education-wise. Okay. Um, do you feel that the role of um, Latino women, Latinas, are adapting as the role of women in the society is adapting, you know, equality, liberation, um, feminism is uh, is really being pushed to move women to the next level. Is that also occurring in the Latino community? It is. As a matter of fact, it is. However, I believe it's the fact that women are fighting for equality, but as um, Hispanic Latina women, that's an even bigger barrier. Because you're not only a woman, but you belong to this cultural um, belief that women should play only a specific role within the family. Hmm. So that's an even bigger barrier, breaking that, that stereotype about the Hispanic women and fighting for equality, but also being accepted within their own communities. I know you're not a Latina, so I, I can't ask you to speak for uh, Latinas, but what do you see is some roles, some strategies that Latinas could use to overcome these barriers? The fact that as community as a whole, we made progress. Okay. We made some progress. There's still a lot of work to do. It's been a struggle, but to fight what they want. If they want education, equality, continue fighting for it because we know that even though it may be hard or in a struggle within our own community, within our family settings, it can be done. Okay. Yeah. It can be done, definitely. And there's nothing to prevent them from uh, seeking what they want and fighting for their dreams. Okay. Uh, so they got to claim it, identify, and work towards it. Uh, how, I'm back to the same question again. How then, as people of faith, can we uh, come around the Latino community and help them at this time? What could some things specifically that people of faith could do? You know, Donald, that's a great question. Uh, when I 
had the privilege of having my first professional opportunity to work at, at this DV shelter, I I saw firsthand how people, well, communities from different faith, faith, different faith communities, reach out to this program that provided services for the most part for for Hispanic women mm-hmm. and provided support. They, uh, I saw different kinds of of ways of supporting them. Not only economically, but inviting that family over to to pray, okay. or having um, a potluck for this family, yeah. or providing this family with a pair of shoes for their daughter or their child. I mean, I've seen, I've noticed how different it is when the the faith community provides support and help from just different members of, of the community who de- don't de- identify themselves as people of faith. Yeah. And that helps a lot with the resiliency of those victims and survivors. So I, I want to shift a little bit and just talk about the the political state of both the country and particularly the state. We're in Arizona, uh, and I don't think anyone would say that Arizona is the most friendly state to our brothers and sisters south of the border. Uh, what's your take on, you know, if on all of that? That's a great, <laughs> awesome question. It's like I was looking forward to that question. <laughs> and if I may say it, and it's from my personal experience, mm-hmm. because uh, when I graduated high school, I did my first two years of college in Yuma, Yuma, Arizona. Mm-hmm. County of Yuma, it's uh, their economic, biggest economics there is, um, is the fields. All good fields? Oh, okay. yeah, the, mm-hmm. the, the fields. Uh, migrant workers. Migrant workers. And mm-hmm. if I may say this, I believe in this state, we are, not kind of, we are very hypocrite in regards to that. Okay. And let me explain why. When I lived in Yuma County, I saw uncountable times migrant workers coming across the border, permitted to come across the border Mm -hmm. to be picked up in order to be taken to the fields to work Mm -hmm. and then transported back to the border. Mm -hmm. And then when I moved to Phoenix, 100 miles away from that, now... When I, when I moved to Phoenix, I saw prosecution, being persecuted, the Hispanic community mm-hmm. being persecuted, being um, stopped uh, because if you, apparently, if you drive while Hispanic, you don't have documents. Right. If I may yeah. express myself. Just like drive while black. You know? Exactly. <laughs> Just mm-hmm. like that, as you mentioned, there's a lot of the different um, comparisons. So when I moved, I was noticing this in Yuma County. People permitted to cross the border in order to work, even though it was it was not lawful work. Mm-hmm. They were not supposedly permitted to be working in the states, and no problem. And now, a hundred miles from there, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, and I see raids, and I see people being prosecuted, be, people being afraid even to call nine one one because yes. they were afraid the mm-hmm. first thing law enforcement will do will be ask for their documents. Mm-hmm. I know. Uh, Yvonne and I uh, used to do inner city ministry in, in central Phoenix and we was uh, working with um, first generation um, Latinos and they tell stories, horror stories about, go- about driving and being stopped, being yanked out of the car, sent to Mexico and the children don't know where they're at, and parents were so afraid that they would never go out together. Yeah. So one would stay home just in case the other person got caught. The, the other person got caught. Yeah. And that's leave it, going throughout your life afraid yeah. that mm-hmm. you may go out to work, but you, you don't know if you're coming back. Yeah. You know, what's even worse, I remember one place that I worked with, I can think of one particular uh, Latina woman who was born in the United States a citizen of the United States and there were multiple times that she came to work late because she was stopped on her way to work and she would have to prove you know that she was a US citizen before the police would let her go and it almost became a game because it would be the same police officers in the same location and there was absolutely nothing she could do about it and they would even say you know the drill Mm-hmm. And, I mean, it was pure harassment. 
And I just, you know, couldn't imagine. Now, if this was a job where she had a less than sympathetic boss and this was happening, they will cause her to lose her job for being late because she would call and say, I'm held up again. I'm not going to get there on time. And, you know, so just seeing that harassment, because so often people look at people who are uh, Latina or Latino, and just we go to undocumented first. And we don't even acknowledge all of the, the millions of people that are here that have either been born here, went through mm-hmm. process or whatever, and they have every right to be here. Mm-hmm. And just they scoop up everybody in a big net. And it's just harassment to people. It's harassment. It's something that uh, created a big, big impact on me and my perspective on, on this mm-hmm. issue mm-hmm. as a Latino. Is when I moved to Phoenix and I recently joined social media, and there was this trending post about community members here in the valley just posting information of where the checkpoints of certain law enforcement agency were. Checkpoints. Checkpoints. This. Uh, Agency was at certain crossroads just checking documentation. And that was, I mean, that created a big impact for me coming from uh, the border and then moving mm-hmm. to Yuma County where I saw the total opposite mm-hmm. yeah. political situation. It's like, okay, now here in my community, myself, if I go out, I may be in the need of carrying my passport. Yeah, that's interesting. Why? Uh, if I am a, a, a citizen. A citizen. I mean, why do I have to carry my passport uh, afraid that they won't believe my status if I provide my driver's license? It's like you're already stereotyped. Stereotyped. That's and stereotyped. especially being a male, I believe the stereotypes carries over into stuff you be afraid of. Yeah. You stop being a citizen, you stop being a college student, you stop being a person who cares about community. Now, the only thing you're Latino, and all of a sudden, there's this image of, and and it's crazy because same similarities between the image of Hispanic people and people of color, black people of color, are very similar. You know, very there's similar. something to be afraid of. There's yes. something to be feared. Yeah. We've seen it with the with different parts in our country how the, the African American community is still struggling with it, and we are going through the same struggle. We've just been a couple months ago we were portrayed for certain. Uh, Politician as all drug dealers and we, we, we won't uh, we won't mention that uh, of name. Course not. We, okay, <laughs> but see that's a continuous struggle for us. So, Alex, I know that you're a person of faith. How, in the faith face of that type of treatment, how do you keep your perspective and and continue on and not hate and you know how do you do it? I, you know, when when I pray in the morning or at night, I had my thoughts, everyone, and and I pray and I myself wake up and say, Alex, this is a real struggle. This is what we're going to, but all of us deserve respect. Mm-hmm. The fact that um, someone does not respect me or my community doesn't mean I'm going to do the same. And and I truly yeah. um, pray for that and for for. Uh, Understanding within our communities that we should all respect each other, mm-hmm. no matter who, do, who you believe in. It, we all believe in something, mm-hmm. and where we believe in, I, I truly believe that they want us to be safe. They want us to be supportive to each other, not be hating towards mm-hmm. towards the rest of the community members or being separate because you are from different color skin or different religion or different social economic status. So I I do go back to my faith in regards to keeping up with the with this work and with this mission of fighting for equality. No to me it's personal because we have a grandson that's um like that's He's Mexican. A, he's Mexican, you know. <laughs> and I worry about him. You know, being subject to the same level of persecution, I'm worried about him not having opportunities. Not, uh, not only is he black, but he's Mexican on top of that. And 
I think uh, what I see is there's a wealth that the culture is so rich. <laughs> you know, the society, you know, mm-hmm. the, uh, the and, you know, and, 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 and the family connection is so important. I, uh, I I really respect that, but at the same time, I see how the social interpretation of a person that's because of color of skin can influence this child in such what negative ways. Mm-hmm. And I pray about that, and I really hope that people of faith can come together and say enough is enough this is each of us are God's child we are created by God and we all have worth regardless of the color of our skin and I always try to connect with the issues of Latinos and people of color because we realize it's an ongoing fight that's that's right and that's my true belief too we all are worth we all deserve respect, and we are children of God. Yes. And I think ultimately it's interesting because we all want the same thing. You know, we want security, we want support and the love of people who are important to us. We want a way to uh, earn our living. We, we want education, we want to learn, we want to better ourselves, we want to contribute something back to uh, our communities. We care about our children and we care about our, our elderly. And so basically, when you get past skin color and culture, we're all wanting and needing the same thing to survive. Uh, Alex, it's been an interesting discussion today. I'll have you come back next week. Perfect. Thank okay. you, sir. I appreciate because it. Because you have shared a lot. And I know you do, you do not speak for the whole Latino community, but I think your voice raised, raised some significant issues that we are people of faith must be knowledgeable about and be supportive of people uh, uh, of, of color as they move into a society. You know, I thank you, and you did a wonderful job. I know you're kind, you're kind of nervous. And also, when's the baby do? Uh, it's the mid February. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This, this is your first one, right? First one. Oh, yeah. Okay. We we'll be praying for you and the baby. And thank safe you so delivery. much. Yeah. Yeah. Safe <laughs> Great to be here. Thank okay. you. And we'll see you next week. Thank you.